All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kieran. I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester, and I'm studying the origins of the universe. Uh, and today I'd like to ask the question, did the universe really start with a Big Bang? But before I get into all of that, I thought it'd be a good idea to give you a sense of, um, sense of the scales that we're, we're talking about here. And so I'd like to start with this really nice quote by Douglas Adams. Uh, I really like this quote, not because it really gives you any exact idea of exactly how big the universe is, but it kind of gets you, gets your brain in the right gear that you were thinking about some pretty big things here. To give you a bit more of an idea of exactly how big we're talking, I'd like to show you this video um, from a group called Cosmic Eye, it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, so let me just start that. There we go. Um, and in this video, we're going to basically zoom out uh, from, start by looking at this woman, Louise, and we're going to zoom out and see all the different uh, scales there are in the universe. Um, and those of you who attended last week's talk have had a really nice talk about the oceans, um, and they might have thought that the ocean was a pretty big thing to study. But as you can see, we're already at this side of the ocean now, and we're barely getting started. So we're going to continue to zoom out, um, and here we get, very soon we'll see the moon. Uh, there it is. And that's, the moon is the furthest that any human has ever travelled. But you, as you can see very quickly, that becomes a tiny pinprick in uh, space. And we can keep zooming out and get past uh, the inner planets and uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And then here we find to the um, New Horizons and Voyager satellites, which are the furthest man-made objects have ever travelled. But we can keep zooming out. Uh, and then we reach the edge of the Oort cloud, which kind of marks the edge of the solar system, so the edge of the influence of the sun. And as we keep going out, we see that the sun is just one star of many, many stars. And these stars are grouped together in a galaxy. Uh, and the galaxy that we live in is called the Milky Way galaxy. But if we zoom out even further, we see that the Milky Way galaxy is actually just one galaxy of many, many galaxies. And these galaxies are all all set, uh, themselves grouped together in what's known as galaxy clusters, which then form together to make this um, cosmic web. Uh, and I'm just going to pause the video here for a second, um, because we're now at the largest uh, length scales that we have ever observed. And in fact, the largest length scales it's even possible to observe, because anything uh, further than this is so far away that light, ha there hasn't been enough time, since, even since the Big Bang, for light to have reached us today. Um, and uh, I want you to, there's something about this uh, length scale I want you to remember, which is that it, at this length scales, the universe looks incredibly uniform. It's exactly the same in all directions. And I want you to remember that because it's going to be important later on. But for now, let's continue the video. And we're going to zoom back in, back past the cosmic web in towards uh, the Milky Way galaxy, and then towards the solar system. There it is, the sun and the solar system. And we go out past the, gut, the planets and in towards uh, the Earth and the Moon. And finally, uh, in towards uh, Louise again. And at this point, the video is going to zoom inwards and we're going to start looking at small scales. So uh, here we are at kind of uh, scales of the eye and biological length scales. Now, these scales I'm not so familiar with because I'm not a biologist, but um, here we have some blood cells and things. Uh, soon we'll get to scales that I'm more familiar with. Um, and yeah, and so in, here we end up with atoms, which I'm more familiar with. And, as you, and what you'll see is at this stage, everything gets a bit fuzzy. Uh, and the reason for that is to do with quantum mechanics. You may know that in quantum mechanics, where something is, is a bit fuzzy. It's not actually that well defined. We keep zooming in past the atom, get to the atomic nucleus, which is the center of the atom. And then we can zoom in even further and we end up, let me pause the video there, uh, at the level of quarks. Now, a quark is the smallest object that we have ever observed. Um, and it's, it was observed in um, Switzerland at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which you may have heard of. And one of the great things about cosmology, and particularly early universe cosmology that we're going to talk to, to you about today, and that I study, is that it actually ties together both these large scales of the whole universe but also the small scales of the quarks. And actually, you actually need to take into account both these huge uh, varieties of scales. Uh, so now let me just fin let the video finish. We'll zoom back out. Um, take it. And back past all the biological length scales, and we end up back with Louise. 
Um, and I kind of summarized that, uh, that video with this slide. We had a few, here are the kind of, some of the scales that you would have seen. So starting at the level of quarks, and then these quarks uh, stick together to form atoms, which can then, and then we, uh, going up, we have humans and human-sized objects, like uh, this backpack for a very unadvisedly decided to take to the Grand Canyon. Not a good idea, I should tell you. Um, and then, of course, we have planets, uh, the solar system, um, and, these, and stars, and then these stars are grouped together in galaxies, which then uh, all form together to make um, what's known as a cosmic world, web or the kind of observable universe. And so what this video is really good at showing you is exactly all the different things that's in the universe today. But what it doesn't show you is how this changes over time, or does this change over time? Has, have we always had um, all of these scales, or does this uh, change over time? So that brings me to my next question. Has the universe always been this way? Um, and the way to work this out is to go and look and to actually see whether the universe is changing. Um, and one of the first people to do this was a man named Edwin Hubble, uh, who in the 1920s uh, took his telescope and went and looked at a whole load of um, galaxies around the Earth. Um, and for each one, he determined two things. One was how far away they were from Earth, and the other was uh, how they were moving. And he discovered something really interesting. Not only was every single galaxy moving, but almost every single one was actually moving away from the Earth. Not only that, but he found that the um, galaxies that were furthest from the Earth were actually moving faster than the galaxies that were closest to Earth. Um, and this was a really interesting discovery. And to kind of work out exactly what this discovery means, um, let me show you this uh, animation. So in, in a minute, so in this animation, this uh, green dot would be the Earth, and then all of these white dots are going to be galaxies. Um, and in a minute, I'll start the animation, and the galaxies will start moving away from the Earth. And, we'll have, and the ones furthest from the Earth will move faster than the ones closest to the Earth. Uh, so there we go. And what you can see is that what Ed, Edwin Hubble really discovered is that the universe is expanding. It's getting bigger. Um, <coughs> at this point, I'd like to answer um, a question that's often asked when people hear, first hear that the universe is expanding. Um, and that question is, what is the universe expanding into? Um, and I'd like to answer that question with a demonstration. So if I just pause the... Uh, sharing, screen sharing for a minute. Can you, can you all see me now? Let me just do that. Um, so, here we have a universe. And uh, I want you to imagine that this, this balloon represents the entire universe, more particularly the surface of the balloon. So, um, and by what I mean by that is that every single thing that we know, every single place in the universe, uh, in fact, every single place that it's possible to be is on the surface of the universe. So this might be the Earth, this might be, oops, sorry, hold it up a bit. This might be the Earth, this might be um, Venus, this might be the Andromeda galaxy, but everywhere is in, um, it's on somewhere on the surface of this balloon. Now, what I mean when I say the universe is expanding is something along this line. Now, what you can see is the universe has got bigger. But you can't really say it's expanded into anything. There's nowhere on the balloon. Remember, the balloon represents everywhere that it's possible to be. And there's nowhere on the balloon that I can point to and say it's expanding into this place or expanding into this place. Similarly, I can't say there's nowhere I can point um, and say it's expanding from there. It's not expanding from anywhere or into anywhere. It's just expanding. Um, and let me, let me clip this and say, because I'm going to need that all later. Oops. Let me go back to the presentation. Uh, okay. So the universe is expanding, and it's not expanding into anything, it's just getting bigger. And so that means we can have a kind of timeline of the universe here. 
And so since the universe is expanding, that means it's going to be bigger in the future. So if this, this is say the present, then over here it's going to be bigger. But if it's bigger in the future, that means it was smaller in the past. And you can see from here, in the past it was smaller. So we can see that the, um, that the universe is a very dynamic uh, object, and in fact changing a lot over time. In fact, not only was it, is it uh, getting bigger, but it turns out that it's actually also getting cooler. And you can kind of see how that works. Uh, we can look at this uh, animation. If, uh, this is a well-known law of phys physics. If you have a bunch of particles trapped in some box like this, and then you decrease the size of that box, then the average energy of those particles, which by which I mean is the temperature, it's the same as the temperature, actually goes up, as you can see. Similarly, if you increase the volume of that box, the average energy of the particles goes down, and so the, te and so the temperature cools. And exactly the same thing happens with the universe. As the universe is expanding, the average energy uh, of particles in the universe is going down, and, the universe, and so the universe is cooling. Um, and so this means that not only will it be bigger in the future, but the universe will also be cooler in the future. Turning that on its head, that means if we look in the past, the universe, when the universe was smaller, then you can see it was also hotter in the past. And this has really important consequences, because it means if we go far enough back in the past, the universe is so hot that certain objects can't exist because they'll just melt. And you, you know this from experience. If you have a reasonably warm house, you know you're not going to find a block of ice in the corner because it will have melted long ago. Similarly, in, if you look in a volcano, you're not going to find any rocks, any solid rocks, because they all melt into lava. Um, and exactly the same thing happens in the universe. And it turns out that this, uh, the time at which um, things melt is related to how big they are. So if I bring back my um, scales of the universe slide again, um, we know that today the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. But if we look back in time to when the universe was only 400 million years old, then the universe was so hot that galaxies couldn't form. And so, uh, and so there were no galaxies. So before, when the universe was younger than 400 million years old, there were no galaxies. It was just stars, uh, just stars floating around in space. And they weren't clumped together to make galaxies. Now we can look further back in time to when the universe was 150 million years old, at which point there weren't even stars. It was too hot for stars to form. Going back even further to when the universe was uh, 10 million years old, there was, um, then it was too hot for anything inside the planets to form. And so there was just a whole bunch of rocks floating around, uh, rocks and dust and matter and things like that. Um, kind of human-sized things. Obviously, there were no humans back then, but there were human-sized rocks. We can go back even further. <coughs> and when the universe was younger than about 380,000 years old, then it was too hot for any matter to exist. And in fact, all, all that was there at night in those early times was just atoms. So you just had a bunch of atoms floating around. In fact, if you want to get technical, technical they were ions, really. They didn't have uh, electrons with them. But now we can go back even further, and if we go back to uh, a time when the universe was only two minutes old, then the universe was so hot, and, the, and so the, part, average, uh, the particles had so much energy that when they hit each other, they smashed together with so much energy that they actually split the atoms in half. So at this early times, the universe was hotter than a nuclear bomb or a nuclear reactor. It was actually hot enough to split these atoms. So earlier times than this, was actually, there was no atoms at all. There was just the constituent parts of the atoms, like the protons and the neutrons. But we can in fact go back even further. And if we go back to this incredibly early time here, um, 10 to the minus 32 seconds, then in fact it was so hot that not even the quarks could exist. And if you remember, the quarks was the smallest object we'd ever observed. And if we go back this far, then, not, then it's too hot even for quarks. To exist. Um, and these are the times that I'm going to be talking about in the rest of the talk. This is the time, these are the times that I'm interested in. 
And as I promised, it ties together both the big scales and the small scales, because we're talking about the whole universe, we're talking about cosmology, but we're also talking about times at which the um, universe was so hot that the only things surviving were quarks and tiny objects, like this. Um, so this is a, um, so at this point, it's probably a good place to stop if there's any questions. Um, I don't know who's, who's in charge of the questions. If anyone's got any questions, just uh, unmute your mic and, uh, and shout out. I think Anthony's thrown one on the chat. Anthony, do you want me to read it or do you want, I think you've got a typo there, you've mixed years and beers, but if Anthony doesn't shout out, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. So Anthony's wondered, is the 13.8 billion years uh, old, is that the observable universe or do we accept it's the total age of the universe? That's a question from Anthony on chat. Mm. Uh, that's a good question. That's, um, that's the to I would say that's the total universe. Um, of course, we don't really know what's outside the observable universe because we can't observe it um, by definition. But in most models, the whole universe is about the same age. Um, and so it's, uh, and, and so yeah, it would be the, the, to the total universe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then Andrew's asking, um, is the smallest particle that can exist relative to the highest energy that exists to make it? Yes, so um, particles, yeah, there's a really strong correlation between the amount of uh, the size of an object, uh, the size of an object and the amount of energy required to make it. In fact, um, it's, yeah, the, it's like you say, the higher, the smaller the object, the more amount of energy you need to make, you need to make it. So, which is, this is why things like quarks are the only thing, are the smallest objects we've been able to um, make and observe in uh, the, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, because they're at the kind of, uh, that's where the energies of the Large Hadron Collider are. Now, whether there are smaller objects than the quarks, um, there's been, whether the quarks are made up of things themselves, there's been a few models that suggest that quarks might be made of things. But I think, that as far as I know, they've all been, they've pretty much all been ruled out now. Um, so we're fairly, um, we're fairly certain that the quarks themselves are not made of smaller things. Um, uh, at least at the scales that we know know about, it might be um, it might be that uh, at some level they're made of. Uh, you may have heard of string theory. So if if string theory is correct, then at some level they then these quarks are actually made of strings. But that would be. But to actually observe these strings and to yeah to observe the strings in the quark, you need to go a lot much much higher energy than we've ever been able to to do. Hey, Andrew, did that answer your question? He's on mute. Yes, yes, it did. Okay. That definitely answered my question. I've never asked anyone. I've never read about well, it anywhere, but I've always had it in my head. So thank you very much. This yeah. is very, very well laid out. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Okay, any more questions before Kieran continues? O over to you, Kieran. Okay, thanks very much. Um, okay, now, uh, before I continue, uh, I just want to give two disclaimers about the rest of my talk. So, as I said, this is, with, um, at these highest energies, we're talking about times when the whole universe was at, uh, as it, at a temperature that was so high that even quarks couldn't exist. So by its very nature, it's going to be a lot more speculative than what I've been saying so far. So I don't want you to take what I'm going to say from now on is gospel because it's a lot more speculative and theoretical than what I've been saying so far compared to there's a lot, there's a lot of evidence for the expansion of the universe for, the, uh, for all these different scales and the times at which they were created. Um, but, but when it comes to the early universe, there's a lot less evidence and so it's, it's a, lot more, a lot less observations that we can make. So it, it's bound to be a lot more speculative and theoretical what I'm going to talk about. On the other hand, which brings me to my second disclaimer, I don't want you to go too far the other way and think that I'm just making all of this up because everything I'm going to talk to you about is based on serious scientific theories uh, which have been published in well-respected journals. 
and um, they are <coughs> and they're based on what evidence that we can see of the early universe, but also on well-known physics that we can test in other ways, um, and also kind of mathematics and logic uh, and various other scientific techniques. And I'm going to try and, as I go along, give you a bit of the information about uh, why we believe these um, theories, not just tell you the theories. So, some, two, two disclaimers. One, don't take everything I say as gospel. Two, don't think I'm making it all up either. Okay, so with those disclaimers, let me continue and ask what happened in the early universe. And I'd like to start with a theory that was first proven by uh, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, at least guys here. Um, and they basically show that if you take the laws of physics as we currently understand them, in particular Einstein's theory of gravity, and you take the universe, uh, the current state of the universe, and you just run the clock backwards. So we, if we know the, the physics describing the universe, we know what it looks like at the moment, we can just run the clock backwards and see what it was like to work out what it was like in the past. And if you just do that exercise, you find that um, the universe must have started at a single point with infinite density. Uh, and you might, you might have been expecting this. This might not surprise you so much. After all, if you kind of go back in time and the universe is getting smaller and smaller, eventually you kind of come to a time where the universe can't get any smaller and it's all at a single point. Uh, and that single point is what we know as the Big Bang, which I'm sure you've, met, you've heard of before. So, Without further ado, let me introduce the standard theory for the early universe, uh, which is the Big Bang Theory. Now, in the Big Bang Theory, the universe started as a single point of infinite density and infinite temperature, just as uh, Hawking and Penrose told us it would. Now, what happened after, just after that, we're not entirely sure, because at that point, the universe was so hot and so dense that to fully describe it, we would need a quantum version of Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, so a theory of quantum gravity. And we don't know what the theory of quantum gravity. We don't know how to combine Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum mechanics. This is one of the biggest problems in physics at the moment. It's one of the, I think, probably the most important uh, unanswered question in physics. Um, and there's plenty of work going into it. It's not something I work on, but there is plenty of people working on it. Uh, probably the leading theory at the moment is something called string theory, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but string theory is a long way from being proven and tested. Um, and even if it was correct, we don't know enough about it to do the right, to do the kind of calculations we need to really understand what's going on here. So that's why I've labeled this section quantum weirdness. But we can make some guesses about what's happening here, because we know that generally speaking, the universe must be getting bigger. If it started as a single point, then it can't get any smaller, so it must be getting bigger. As I said before, if it's getting bigger, then it must be getting cooler. Uh, and the same thing, if it's infinite temperature here, then it can't get any hotter, so it must be getting cooler. So if it's getting bigger and cooler, then eventually it's going to reach a temperature, um, it's going to cool enough so that we can start to use uh, well-known normal physics. Um, this time, when we can start to do that, it's known as the Planck time. And once we hit that, um, <coughs> once we hit that time, then we can start using, then we know what's going to happen. It's what I, was, what I said before. We can have, start having the quarks forming. These are going to stick together to make um, atoms. These atoms are going to uh, come together to create uh, dust and rocks and things. And then we're going to get stars, galaxies, uh, clusters of galaxies until we end up with a universe that looks very much like today. Now, before I continue, I'd like to focus in on um, the Big Bang itself, so this moment of creation. Because there's a few uh, interesting subtleties regarding the Big Bang. I think are really, really interesting, but quite, can be quite hard to get your head around. Um, and so the first, first thing I want to say is that, um, <coughs> by definition, all of space is inside the universe. That's what I mean when I say the universe. I mean all of space, everywhere that you can see, everywhere that you can't see, everywhere that it's possible to be, that is the, that is the universe. And so when, when I say at the Big Bang, 
uh, the universe was at a single point here, that means that all space was at that single point. Everything in the universe was at that one point. In fact, that one point was actually the only place that it's possible to be. And so if I were to ask you, where were you at the Big Bang? You were at that point. Where was the Eiffel Tower at the Big Bang? It was at that point. Where was Venus at the Big Bang? At that one point. Where was the Andromeda Galaxy at the Big Bang? It was at that one point. That one point was the only place that it's possible to be. Um, now, just to help uh, maybe ram that point home a little bit more, because it can be quite a difficult thing to understand, I'm going to go back to my balloon universe. So you can see me again now. Uh, I got my balloon. Well, some of the things fall off. Let's see if I can stick it back on. Um, okay. And now I'm going to, um, we, ex we had an expanding universe, but now I'm going to go backwards in time. And so we're going to watch the universe um, contract. So there we go. The universe is starting to contract. Now, unfortunately, this is a physical balloon, so at some point it's all going to go floppy. So I'm going to stop it before it does. But if this was the universe, you could imagine it continuing to get smaller and smaller and smaller until we got towards the Big Bang, until all of this was at a single point, um, which is the Big Bang. And you can see that at that time, everything, every, every single one of these stars or galaxies would be at the same point of the Big Bang. It would all be, uh, yeah, it would all be right on top of each other. And so this kind of helps uh, I think answer another question that I'm often asked, which is where did the Big Bang happen? Um, and you can see that that doesn't really have an answer either, because the Big Bang really happened everywhere, because at the Big Bang, everything was at the same point. So really, the Big Bang was happening everywhere. There's nowhere on this balloon and set, I can point and say, that's where the Big Bang happened, or that's where it happened, because it happened everywhere at once. And similarly in the universe, there's nowhere I can point to out in the universe and say, that's where the Big Bang happened because it really happened everywhere. Um, at the Big Bang, everywhere was at the same place. Okay, uh, let me go back to the um, PowerPoint. Okay, so um, <coughs> that brings me to my sec, so now let me uh, tell you that second um, point about uh, the Big Bang, which is potentially even harder to get your head around. Um, so that is that, do you know, there we go. The universe um, also contains all of time. And you can kind of think about this, that space and time are very closely uh, interlinked. So if the universe contains all of space, it must also contain all of time. And that means the beginning of the universe was the beginning of time itself. And you can maybe understand this, but only think about, if you imagine bef a time before the Big Bang, then there would be no space, there would be no universe, and so there's no space, nowhere for anyone to be. And so how could you possibly have time without space? So, that, so what that tells you is that there was no time before the Big Bang. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. In fact, yeah, there is no such thing as before the Big Bang. This phrase, before the Big Bang, doesn't really make sense. Now, to try and explain this a bit better, because I can understand this quite, can be quite a hard thing to get your head around, uh, I'd like to make an analogy uh, to the lines of latitude and longitude on, on, on the Earth. Now, I want you to imagine that your position in the universe, so where you are in the universe, is labelled by um, the line, a line of longitude on this um, diagram here. So this, this line might correspond to Manchester, uh, this might correspond to Venus, this might correspond to Whirlpool Galaxy, Etc. So each of these lines represent a different point in the universe. The lines of latitude in this uh, analogy correspond to time. With, so the, with the further north you go, being backwards in time, and travelling south would correspond to going forward in time. And so in this analogy, the Big Bang would be the North Pole. And you can see that at the North Pole, every, all the lines of longitude uh, end up at the same point. So if I was standing at the North Pole now, as well as being very cold, I would actually be standing in every, at every single line of longitude at once. Similarly, at the Big Bang, uh, at the Big Bang, you, you would be at every single point in the universe at once, because uh, as I said before, 
at the Big Bang, every point of the universe comes to the same point. But this also tells you about um, uh, time. And as I said, going backwards in time corresponds to travelling north. And when you're at the North Pole, you cannot go further north. It doesn't make sense to go north when you're at the North Pole. The only way you can go is south. And you can see that, that there's no more lines of latitude further north than the North Pole. Similarly, there's in, this, uh, in the same vein, the Big Bang, there is no time before the Big Bang. And, so, and these two phrases are very analogous, before the Big Bang and north of the North Pole. And, and so you can see, hopefully, that the idea of before the Big Bang doesn't really make sense, in the same way as north of the North Pole doesn't really make sense. Um, let me pause there again for some more questions, if anyone has any. Uh, Thanks, Kieran. You're currently blowing my mind. And uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So yeah. um, I'll ask Dale. Uh, Dale uh, posed a question. Uh, Dale, do you want to ask it in real life by unmuting? OK, so Dale's question, it was from a couple of slides ago and was asking, is the early universe pure energy. Oh, he says, sorry, Mike, not working. Okay, Dale. No worries, dude. Um, so how, how far back are we talking? Hang on. Yeah. His question was, um, so the early universe was pure energy, question mark. Uh, yeah. Uh, Before the yes. quantum weirdness, yes. Yeah. The quant well, the quantum weirdness, we don't really know. Um, yes, I suppose it was pure energy. Um, it was, so energy, obviously, so pure energy is a bit of a loaded phrase because um, energy has to be in some kind of form. Um, so, uh, let me think, at this point it would have been, um, well, at this point we don't really know what it was because it would be these quantum uh, weirdness, but it would most likely be in, uh, in terms of uh, motion of the, um, uh, say, well, let's let's say string theory is correct, which is a big set, a big if, but let's just assume that for now. Then, most likely, the energy at this point would be um, wiggles of the string. Basically, the strings would be wiggling around, and that's where the energy would be would be stored. Um, then, um, <clears throat> now, as I said. What's exactly happening in this quantum weirdness section, we don't really know. We know what we know a bit better is kind of after the quantum weirdness. Um, and then what we have is a lot of, uh, a lot of energy will be in uh, light and um, uh, uh, what's known as photons, which you may have heard of before, which is basically a particle of light. Um, and these would be, um, this would, these would be carrying most of the energy at some, at this point. Um, and then, um, Yes, yeah, so this is, so in fact, that's known as the radiation dominated era, there's a technical term for it, which just means that most of the energy is in radiation, or which is another word for light. Um, and then at some point, they switched over and you get matter domination and basically matter. So stuff becomes uh, the most dominant form of energy. Uh, and that, yeah, that, there's that transition in the early universe somewhere around here before, before we start getting dust and things. Um, so I hope, hopefully that answered, answered the question. All right, so that, that was from Dale. Thank you. Um, and Andrew, Andrew posed the question. Andrew, do you want to unmute and ask it? Or should I read it out? I don't mind asking online. Go for it. Okay, um, if this universe has existed for a specific time, it's 13 point something billion years, isn't it? Um, <laughs> does that in indicate that it is finite in size? And if that is so, is it part of a multiverse? So if that mm. was so, could we gravitationally be crunching into some other universe instead of back into this one? Okay, that's a lot, that's a lot of questions to unpack. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, some of which I will actually come to in a bit. In a bit. Um, so let me, um, yeah, let me start with the, um, I can't remember your first, your first question was about the, uh, is the universe a finite size? 
Um, and actually, this I might need to revise my answer to a previous question as whether this 13.8 billion years is the observable universe or the total universe. I think I'm going to revise it and say that it's the observable universe because, as as I said, we don't know we don't know anything beyond the observable universe. That's almost by definition you can't observe it, so you don't know what's going on there. Um, now there are plenty of different theories. It depends whether some theories say that um, the universe is a finite size. Um, I'd say if the if the um, if you take the Big Bang theory at face value, uh, which is what I'm kind of discussing at the moment, then the universe is almost certainly a finite size. Um, I think it would have to be just by uh, causality. Uh, as you said, if it's, start, if it's a finite time, it can't be an infinite size. Um, but there are other theories that say um, that there are, and actually I'll come, I'll come to one of them in a, uh, later on in the talk, that say that actually, that, that casts a bit of doubt on that question as to whether the universe is actually finite or whether it's infinite. Um, the other, yeah, let me talk about that. Uh, what, was, what was your other question about? Uh, no. Sorry, is that what you're talking to me? Uh, yeah, yeah. That that if, right. it's, if, the, if the universe is finite, does it mean that we're part of a multiverse? Therefore, we could be, instead of crunching back onto ourselves, we could be crunching into another universe. Right, yeah. So um, I should say being finite doesn't mean we're necessarily part of a multiverse, but it could, we could be. And in fact, I, I will go and talk about the multiverse later on. Um, and if, if we are part of the multiverse, um, then we could end up not so much, I wouldn't really describe it as crunching back in on another universe, but it, you could basically have two universes near each other could collide. Um, you could have two universes colliding, which I think would be similar to what, what you're saying. Um, so yeah, and, you, and there are people out there looking for that because that would be a good signal. That would be the only way we'd really be able to tell uh, if we were part, sorry, part of the multiverse, if if one of these other universes crashed into us, because um, otherwise they're completely separate and they can't you can't observe them. Um, now collapsing back on itself, let me just uh, address that. There was um, there was a time for a long time. So as, as, as I said, the universe is, is expanding today, and there was a long time uh, during which. Uh, people were debating whether the universe was going to continue expanding or whether at some point it was going to stop stop expanding and turn around and kind of recollapse and collapse in on itself. Now that question has actually been answered uh, fairly recently. One, I think it was 2011, it won the Nobel Prize for this discovery that actually this expansion is getting quicker. So if it, if it was going to turn around, you'd expect the expansion to be slowing down so that at some point it would stop and go back the other way. But in fact, when people did really careful uh, measurements, they found that this expansion is actually accelerating and getting quicker. That's why I'm asking whether we could be crunching onto another universe because where it, the, it's accelerating, no? the universe uh, expanding. That's, what, that's yeah, uh, the universe, reason why I'm asking that. Yeah. Um, now, it, it really depends on what the model of the uh, multiverse is. If it's the model that's based on inflation, which I'll talk about later, then... I don't think it would because it would never be, a, even the accelerated expansion wouldn't be able to catch up. So it wouldn't, I'm sorry, it wouldn't necessarily. It, it could, you could have a collision by chance, but it's not like guaranteed. Um, Thanks. So yeah, maybe we can talk about that again when I get to- I've got a couple of questions for later. I'll leave them for later. Thank you for your time. <laughs> no, well, can I add to that one? So yeah. is, is there a rate of change of acceleration in the, um, it could, Ooh. it could be that we're still in an accelerating period that could slow down and then come back on itself. Rate of change of acceleration. Um, that would be very hard to calculate. Well, it'd be very hard to observe in these terms, because it's yes. hard. It's hard enough to observe the acceleration itself. So working out whether that acceleration is changing would be really hard. Um, I'm trying to think whether it could. Um, if it did, it would kind of blow a lot of our theories of, of the universe of physics out of the water, because um, in the kind of 
Einstein rel relativity and um, Einstein's theory of gravity, I think, yeah, it would be very difficult to, to get an ex uh, accelerating acceleration as such, if you, if you like. Um, but, uh, well, for, for that acceleration to be kind of going faster than it currently, than it currently is. I mean, it's, I, should, I should say the rate of acceleration is changing because what we know is that um, this acceleration actually has happened quite recently. And you can, actually, you can kind of see it from this, this graph, actually. This, this, this is quite a good picture to show. Because for a long time, the expansion was quite uh, tame. And this kind of uptick at the end is around about now. And what we find is it's actually around about, it's only around about now that it started accelerating. So, um, so yeah, before before now it was expanding fairly uh, in a fairly normal way, um, but now it's uh, it's accelerating. It's expand. Uh, sorry, the expansion is accelerating, um, and actually the reason for that is because we think that um, the type of energy that dominates the universe is actually changing. It's changing from being matter dominated, which is what I was saying before, so that most of the energy is in matter, to now. Most of the energy is in, well, yeah, it's becoming, most of the energy is transferring to something called dark energy. Um, and I wasn't really planning to talk about dark energy in, in this. And actually, I don't really know much about dark energy. And in fact, no one really knows much about dark energy other than it, it's a type of energy that causes the universe to expand. Um, and um, there's, uh, yeah, this acceleration is kind of evidence that this dark energy is uh, kind of taking over now. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, or probably raises more questions. Uh, so if you pause the other questions for in a bit, when, when uh, Kieran continues, Andrew, that's really good. Uh, Miranda says she's loving the analogy of the uh, longitude and latitude. It helps her get her head around that concept. I'm worried about going south. Um, <laughs> we didn't get to that, but ah, uh, yeah, to that. Um, John has asked, um, John, do you want to shout out or do you want me to read it? So he, John asks, is the universe expanding in one direction or does it expand in all directions from the point of the Big Bang? John, so, what, what does that, what's that question mean, John? <laughs> um, so let me bring back my balloon to answer that question. Uh, oh, please. Yeah. Jeez. So remember, the, uh, the balloon represents the whole of the universe. So everything, everything in the universe, every possible, possible place it's possible to be is um, on, somewhere on this balloon. So when it's expanding, you can see um, you can see that it's not expanding from anywhere or to anywhere. It's expanding the same everywhere. I think that kind of answers your question that it's expanding the same everywhere. And also it tells you that there's no point of the Big Bang. There's nowhere I can point to on this balloon and say the Big Bang happened here because it actually at the Big Bang, everything was at the same, same point. So this expansion is really, is really just the universe getting bigger. You've got to think of it as just the universe getting bigger. It's kind of different from uh, maybe an expansion you're more familiar with, but it's just a, it's just a getting bigger. It's not from anywhere or to anywhere. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. And I suppose that means we're all getting bigger, but it's relative, so we don't have to go to Weight Watchers yet. <laughs> um, so actually, that's not entirely true because it's not we're because we're being held together by. Um, uh, electro electromagnetic forces and inter uh, like uh, interatomic forces and things like that, um, and those things are not uh, those things stay the same. So those those distances stay the same. What's getting bigger is um, stuff that's not kind of gravitationally not not sorry attracted attached to each other. So like galaxies are getting further apart. So you can kind of see if I can go back to my balloon again. So you see, as I, as I uh, blow up the balloon, you'll see that the, these different galaxies get further apart, 
but they don't expand themselves. So these, this ah. galaxy would actually still work at the same time. So it's just distance, really. Yeah, yeah it's just the distances between things that, that get bigger. The actual objects themselves, um, and anything kind of <laughs> held together by forces, those forces still act to hold it together. Okay, cool. Are there any other questions before Kieran continues? Over to you, Kieran. Okay, cool. Let me uh, get the slides back on. Uh, right, good. Okay, so now that we've kind of gone over that, um, I feel like this is a good time to um, to talk about uh, the successes of the Big Bang Theory. Why uh, scientists, why the Big Bang Theory is such an ex well accepted theory of the um, universe. Um, and talk about uh, some of the things that it explains. Um, and the first thing that it explains is, it explains why the universe is expanding. So if the universe started at a single point, then as I said before, it can only get bigger. So it must be expanding. And when we look at the universe today, we see that the universe is expanding, just as uh, Hubble did in the 1920s. Second thing it explains is the abundance of the elements in the universe. So as I said, as I said before, uh, during the early universe, you've got the formation of atoms. But those of you who remember your periodic table, remember that there's lots of different types of atoms. And in fact, you can calculate exactly how much of each atom you would get in the Big Bang Theory. And you find about 75% hydrogen, 25% uh, helium, and a small fraction of uh, the other atoms. And when we look in the universe today, what do we see? 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, and a small fraction of the other atoms. Um, and so it matches really well. Uh, it also explains uh, the structure of stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies. As I said before, these, uh, and, uh, these uh, atoms come together to form stars, which come together to form galaxies and clusters. And there's been several, uh, many, many simulations of this. Uh, to work out what these uh, structures would look like in the Big Bang Theory. Uh, and they all, they match what we observe very, very well. Uh, and the final piece of evidence is uh, to do with something called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is this thing here. Um, and I thought this was an important uh, piece of evidence to talk, tell you about, because this is the one that really first convinced scientists that they were onto a winner with the Big Bang Theory. Now, what the CMB is, is if you were to take your telescope and look out at the universe, as well as seeing stars, galaxies, planets, etc., you would also see a very faint background light. And you'd see that background light no matter which direction you looked. Um, and so that's hence why it's called the cosmic background radiation. Um, now, within the Big Bang Theory, it has a very good explanation for this. Um, it's says that this is actually light left over from the Big Bang itself. And this explains why it's everywhere. Um, <coughs> because as I, as I said, at the Big Bang, every, everywhere was at the same point. So anything from the Big Bang must be everywhere. And that's exactly what we see in this cosmic micro background radiation. Um, and there's really not, um, no one has another, a good explanation. Sorry, there's no other explanation for this. Uh, this light other than the Big Bang Theory. And so this was really the first, uh, not the first, but this was certainly the piece of evidence that really convinced scientists that this was the right theory. Um, and just to explain the microwave part of it, uh, the universe has expanded so much since the Big Bang that this light has become diluted and diluted. And so now it's at a level where it's actually below um, the level, uh, below the uh, visible part of the spectrum. Those of you who remember the electromagnetic spectrum, Remember, this is now below the uh, visible part of the spectrum and in the microwave. So it's actually the same kind of uh, radiation that you have in your microwave oven, but of course, a lot less, a lot less strong. So don't worry, it's not gonna, not gonna cook you. Um, okay, so I hope I've convinced you that there's some really good reasons to believe in the Big Bang Theory. There's some really, that uh, it's, it's got a lot of evidence behind it. Um, but if this was the whole story, um, if, if the Big Bang Theory explained everything, then there wouldn't really be any point in me um, studying it, would there? So that brings me to my next slide, which are some of the failures of the Big Bang Theory. Some of the um, things the Big Bang Theory doesn't explain, and the reasons why I still have a job. And the first thing I wanted to say is that a single point of infinite density 
doesn't actually make any sense. It's not possible to have everything um, on top of each other at a single point because they just, they just wouldn't fit. Um, and so what you can, and so what that tells you is that this, the actual moment of the Big Bang, we don't really know what happens. We can go, uh, we, we can go uh, arbitrarily close, we can get closer and closer and look at universe, a universe that's smaller and smaller, um, and that all makes sense. But the actual moment of the Big Bang itself doesn't make sense, and we don't really know how to describe it. In fact, we don't really know what happened at any time before the Planck time, which if you remember is the time before which we start needing a uh, quantum theory of gravity. And since we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, we don't really know uh, what happened at these early times. Um, <coughs> another uh, thing that the Big Bang Theory doesn't explain is, um, is what happened to the, where is all the antimatter? Now you may or may not have heard of antimatter before, but essentially what it is, is that every um, particle that we've ever discovered, we know that, that we've also discovered an antiparticle, a corresponding antiparticle. Um, which has the same mass as that particle, but an opposite electric charge. So, for example, here we have a, an atom made of positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons, um, and here we have an, a corresponding anti-atom with negatively charged anti-protons and positively charged anti-electrons. Um, and <coughs> we know uh, we know these an this antimatter exists. We can create it. We can uh, work with it, we can study it. In fact, I mean, it's used in uh, scientific research all the time. In fact, it's even used in uh, medical uh, imaging technology. If anyone's ever heard of or had a PET scan, that uses antimatter. So it's very well, well established. And what's more, we know that uh, the laws of physics treat both antimatter and matter on a very equal footing. And any, um, any process we know that can create matter also creates. Um, the same amount of antimatter. But when we look at the universe today, we see only matter. We don't see any antimatter. And so the question is, where did all the antimatter go? And that, uh, yeah, what, where is it all? And that can't be answered. And Big Bang Theory doesn't answer that question. Uh, I'd also like to tell you about um, the dark matter question. Now, if you remember, I was telling you about the simulations of the uh, creation of stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And I told you that they matched um, observations very well. What I didn't tell you is that they only match observations well if we assume that a large amount of stuff out there that we can't see. And this is this extra stuff we call dark matter. And there's a lot of evidence that this dark matter is actually there. Uh, you can look at the uh, motions of galaxies and, in the, and how they rotate and how they interact with each other, you find that that motion only makes sense if, you, if there is a lot of uh, extra matter in there that you can't see. Um, in fact, even if you look at the CMB, the, remember this uh, background radiation, and you kind of analyze the patterns in that radiation, that provides some evidence that there is, uh, that there must be some, uh, some dark matter during uh, during the early universe. Um, but the Big Bang Theory, no one has any idea really what this dark matter is. Now, I'd love to go into a lot more detail about these questions because they're really fascinating. Um, and I could probably give a talk on each one individually, but uh, unfortunately I don't have enough time to go through all of them. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm only gonna focus on one uh, pro problem with the Big Bang. If you're interested in these, I should say, if you ask me some questions at the end or in the next break. Um, but uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on um, a different problem, uh, which is one that I've worked out, worked on a lot, and this is known as the horizon problem. Now, the horizon problem can both be summed up with the question, why is the universe so boring? Now, I know what you might be thinking, the universe isn't that boring. I mean, I just showed you a whole load of interesting stuff that happens in the universe and interesting things uh, that are in the universe, planets, stars, galaxies, etc. But I want you to remember back to the video I showed you right at the beginning, and remember on those largest scales. And on those largest scales, the universe actually was quite boring. It looked exactly the same in all directions. 
And this is what I tried to um, indicate with this diagram here. No matter which direction I look at the universe, it looks exactly the same. If I look over here, over here, over here, over here. But this is actually quite unexpected because the universe is so big and these two regions are so far apart that even if I've been traveling constantly for the entire history of the universe, and if I've been traveling at the speed of light, which is the fastest I could possibly travel, then I wouldn't have been able to make it from one side to the other. It just wouldn't, still wouldn't have been enough time to make it from one side to the other. And so, since the speed of light is the fastest that anything can travel, that means that nothing has been able to travel from one region to the other. No stars, no dust, no light, no information, no electricity, no nothing. And so there's no way that this region of the universe can know anything about what's going on at this, in this region of the universe. And yet, somehow they're the same, somehow they look exactly the same. So why do they look the same? Why did we not end up with a universe that looked more like this, maybe? Or this? Or this? Or this? Why is it that we happen to live in a universe where all of these different regions, which have no way of talking to each other, happen to all end up looking exactly the same? Um, and this is quite a big coincidence. Um, and it's a coincidence that cannot be explained by the Big Bang Theory. I mean, Bang Theory has no explanation for that. You've just got to take it on faith, essentially. And so we need a new theory, or we need to modify the Big Bang Theory and add something new to explain why uh, this is the case. And um, the kind of most accepted theory to explain this um, is, something, is a theory known as inflation. Now inflation uh, is a proposed uh, event in the early universe during which the universe expanded incredibly, incredibly rapidly. We're talking a factor of 100 trillion trillion in a tiny fraction, fraction of a second. And as you can see, if, even if the universe was uh, very non-homogeneous before inflation, after this expansion happened, uh, because as you can see, if we let this video finish, we end up with a universe that looks a lot more um, homogeneous and looks the same in all directions. And so this can explain why we have this, can, this um, why this universe looks the same in all directions. Um, and you may think that inflation is, a bit of a, is quite a tame theory. I mean, what is it? It's just a bit, of a bit of extra expansion in the early universe. But it actually comes with a lot of interesting consequences. One is that because this universe expanded so rapidly and so much, that means that the universe, the observable universe we see today, is a tiny fraction of the whole universe. The whole universe is a lot, lot bigger than what we can see today. Um, it's, also, it's even more interesting than that because the inflation didn't necessarily stop at the same time everywhere in space. And this leads to the creation of what's known as bubble universes. Comes, this is coming back to the question that we asked earlier. Because if you imagine inflation going along and then inflation stops, but it doesn't stop everywhere at the same time, it just stops in this little region of space here, this uh, bubble. Now, inside this bubble, uh, inflation has stopped, so we get the normal evolution of the universe. We get the construction of uh, atoms, and then they come together to form stars, galaxies, etc. But outside this bubble, inflation is still going on, so there's nothing. But of course, there's nothing to stop. Inflation could also stop um, over here at uh, another time, or even at the same time. And then, uh, and then form a little bubble here, which would contain uh, galaxies, stars, etc. And then you, and you'd end up with thousands and hundreds of thousands, millions maybe of these different bubbles, um, each with their own set of stars, own set of galaxies, um, and all completely separate from each other. And just to emphasize, everything that we can observe, our entire observable universe, would be inside this uh, little bubble. I should, and I should say, not even the whole, of, we might not even be able to observe the whole of the bubble. We might only be able to see a tiny fraction of the bubble. But certainly we wouldn't be able to see anything outside this bubble. Uh, and so these bubbles are completely, um, completely uh, discon disconnected with each other and, no, and have no way of communicating with each other. Unless, as I kind of alluded to earlier, they might, by chance, one or two of them might crash into each other. But depending on the model, that's, that can be quite unlikely or it can be likely depending on some of the details. Um, 
And so, yeah, we end up with this uh, situation where you've got lots of different bubble universes, and this is uh, often known as the multiverse. Um, now, perhaps now would be a good time to pause again for some more questions. Uh. Okay, thanks, Kieran. So, um, in terms of questions, we've got um, Anthony's asking um, if the Big Bang happened everywhere at once, do we see the cosmic microwave background radiation in the foreground also? Um, so, it's, so it happened everywhere at once, but it happened at a certain time. So um, you can kind of think of um, it's in the foreground. It wouldn't really be in the foreground so much because it's, uh, I guess stuff would get in the way. Um, I mean, is that Anthony? Are you there? Do you want to expand on your question? Yeah, maybe. I'm just trying to think. Um, he, he I think the correct answer is quite hard to quite hard to see because this background light is so faint. It'd be very hard to distinguish it from this point. Whether yeah, whether it's um, yeah, maybe maybe if you're expanding your question a bit more. Anthony's there. Is, can you unmute Anthony? Yes, I can unmute. Hey, uh, um, I'll have to get back to you in a second. I think how to expand the question. Okay. Well, yeah. Linked with that, Dale, who we know doesn't have a mic, is asking. Uh, is the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, CMB for short, um, is it the old static on TVs? <laughs> uh, it, I mean, that is actually how it, well, it wasn't found by TVs, but it is what it looked like when, when people first discovered it. Like, I'm blanking on the people who actually first discovered it now, but I know when they discovered it, they saw it as like a static in their observations. They were trying to look at some galaxies and they noticed that they had, had them some static and they thought there was something wrong with their telescope. They thought, ah, oh, we're picking up, we've got this static, there's something wrong with our telescope. And it turned out to actually be the uh, cosmic microwave background. Um, but yeah, I, I, it wouldn't be the static on TV, because that's uh, a different, different wavelength than that. And it would be, it's also a lot uh, strong. This, this signal's a lot weaker. You need a very strong telescope to be able to see it. Is it level? Who discovered the CMB? Uh, not far from here? Uh, Possibly. You could be right, yeah, you could be right. I feel like I, I, should have, I should have looked that up, yeah. I think you're right. I think it could be level, actually. Yeah. Well, we, we've got um, a couple more questions on the chat. Th thanks for that, Paul. Um, so we've got Andrew. Andrew, do you want to unmute and ask your question, or sh should I read it out from the chat? Um, I don't mind asking it, thanks. Uh, I normally attend events, but <laughs> uh, um, I'm mute. Uh, could this universe be the result of some extremely supermassive black hole energy jet or some other form of huge energy jet which started off, started off as a single point and then spread and coalesced into matter as it cooled and slowed down? Uh, that might offer an explanation why everything in this universe is expanding uniformly and the uh, microwave background radiation. Um, I don't see why you need the the um, black hole beforehand. I mean, just just the having the the Big Bang singularity, the, the single point, um, is enough to get this uh, uniform expansion. So it could just be an energy jet of, of some other. Um, so you're thinking you're thinking about having an energy jet like before before the Big Bang, so sort of causing the Big Bang. Yes. Um, yes, causing, yes. I haven't seen any models uh, kind of claiming that. Um, I think it just wouldn't be able to have enough energy because we're talking about enough energy to create the entire universe. And I, even like the most powerful quasars are just tiny. I mean, they're about the size of, galaxy, of like a single galaxy. And as, as you see, saw in the beginning of the video at the beginning, there are so many galaxies around. Um, it also, it doesn't seem like it would, well, yeah, let me, let me just say that I, as far as I know, there isn't any, there aren't any theories that um, suggest that, uh, that there was a kind of, uh, that it came from a quasar in that, in that way. 
And hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. I could, Andrew. Okay. This one, I don't, I don't know if it's a relation. Christian Finn, is it your brother or dad teasing yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're asking, uh, as well as density, would mass and gravity also be uh, infinite at the beginning of time? Uh, mass would, so it, it would only be the density. There would be a finite amount of mass so at a single point. So, you know, density is mass divided by volume. So if you have any mass but the volume is zero, then your mass goes up to infinity. Sorry, your density goes up to infinity. Um, so the mass, uh, the mass wouldn't be infinite, but the, uh, it would just be the density that would be infinite. Okay, good. And uh, Anthony, have you, have you remembered what you wanted to ask, brother? Uh, I've been pondering on it through this entire lot and uh, formulating a question, I think. Um, I think the original question was so like the microwave radiation we see now is that high energy that's red shifted mm. all the way down to microwave now that we see yeah um and obviously if there's a planet that same distance in the other direction to us they'd see the same thing in every direction yeah are we able to see are we able to detect say the microwave radiation back ugh, the background radiation that they're detecting from this direct does that make sense uh i think so i think the key with the background <laughs> radiation is it's i think i think i understand what you're saying so it's basically saying if we're on earth we see some background radiation someone on venus sees some other background radiation now because it's background radiation they would that would look exactly the same so no matter whether you were here or on Venus, or uh, in another galaxy, you would see the background radiation would look the same. Um, and in kind of relate regards to whether it's foreground or where this is coming from, in terms of a distance, you can't really measure a distance to the background radiation because um, it's just it's just everywhere. The way we the way we usually measure dis distances, I mean, there's whole complicated way of measuring distances to things um, but none of and um, yeah I can't really go into them now I think because it would take another seminar um, but none of them really work on this background radiation because they're not an object it's not a single object it's just basically background light everywhere thank you very much and I think we'd all sign up to that seminar so crack <laughs> on yeah maybe, maybe you're happy back then for that <laughs> So we've got, we, we run for a few more, Kieran, before we continue. Okay. Um, John T's asking, is the model of the multiverse, in this model of the multiverse, were all the bubbles created in one big bang event, are there other models with different origin events? Um, so, in this model of the universe, you would have one big bang, one big bang event, followed by inflation, and then this inflation would stop at different port, port at different moments at different points in space. Um, and so uh, they would, yeah, they would have a common origin, if you like, the same Big Bang, um, but they would end up being completely separated because uh, they just, these inflation, this inflation would just uh, spread them out so far. So hopefully that answers the question. Um. Alan is asking, could quantum entanglement explain the uniformality of um, the universe? Uh, quantum entanglement. Uniformity, sorry. Yeah. Um, not, no, not really, because, uh, just don't know why. Um, quantum entanglement is a very, Firstly, quantum entanglement would almost, so if, if these different regions of the universe were quantumly entangled, that entanglement would almost certainly be destroyed by the early universe. The temperature is, I mean, if you've been following any of the um, developments of quantum, quantum computing, um, you know that they're trying to build a computer that takes advantage of this quantum entanglement. Um, and you'll also know that it's incredibly hard because every time they try and make these this computer that's called quantum entangled, uh, the entanglement gets destroyed. It's very, very easy to destroy this entanglement. Basically, if it has any interaction with anything, this entanglement gets destroyed. 
So I don't see any way that this entanglement could have survived in a really hot, uh, dense suit that happened right at the beginning of the universe. So, I, so okay. that would be my answer to that, I think. And then, okay, we've got a shout out to Barry and Louis who have told us that apparently the C CMB was discovered by Wilson and Penzias. Uh, back in 1964. Um, Andrew's got a couple of short questions which we'll take before we carry on. Andrew? Hi, thanks. Uh, I didn't want to hassle you. I keep asking so many questions. Um, I'm just going to get my post it. There it is. Um, could it be possible that antimatter can only be recreated artificially and that's why we can't find it elsewhere in the universe? Um, what would be the difference between creating it artificially and creating it? How would how would I have no how idea. I have no idea, but that, I thought that could be a possible explanation. Um, it, it's different. The way we are creating antimatter is different to the way it happens in nature and in the universe. Um, the way we're creating antimatter is essentially smashing stuff together. The way the early universe works is there's lots of stuff with lots of energy smashing together. So. I don't but see it, It's not smashing at the beginning, at the Big Bang, is it? At the Big Bang itself? Um, there is a what so what might answer your question is in like three slides time, you, you might have an answer to that question of the way that we could create antimatter that's different to kind of just smashing stuff together. Um because I mean, either way you still have the question of You've got lots of stuff smashing together, it's going to create matter and antimatter in equal parts. And that's going to happen. If you've got this matter, this energy, this stuff that's so high energies, it's going to create matter, it's going to create antimatter. Um, question is, why is it only creating, why is it creating more matter than antimatter? Because eventually that ma antimatter and antimatter is going to come together and destroy each other. But we know it doesn't completely destroy each other, otherwise there wouldn't be any panics or anything for us, anywhere for us to live afterwards. So there must have been slightly more matter created than antimatter, so that when they all destroyed each other, there was some left over. Um, and there has been lots of processes kind of uh, theorized and talked about um, that this might have happened, and, based, and the reason that it doesn't happen in, uh, in these models, the reason it doesn't happen in our experiments is that it happens at a much higher energy. You need, you need to smash particles together at a higher energy to get this difference between matter and antimatter. Thanks. Uh, I've got a couple of more questions, but if you don't have the time, I understand. Uh, I'm not in charge of the time. The short. The short <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, go ahead with a short question. All right. If all space is inside this universe, as you said, which I'd never conceived of before, is that because there's no such thing as a total vacuum as some residual energy remains inside? It's, it's a definition. It's how I'm defining the universe. I, I call everything, when I, when I say what I, what I mean by when I say the universe, is I mean everything. So it doesn't, if there was a total vacuum, and you can have vacuums, I mean, there's, there's interesting quantum properties of vacuums, which I think is what you're alluding to. But even if there could exist a total vacuum, that would still be part of the universe. It would still be a place you could be, and I'd still count that as part of the universe. So that would still be somewhere on my balloon, uh -huh. um, but it would be a part, of, a part of my balloon that doesn't have anything in it. Uh, one last question. If the multiverse is made out of a multitude of bubble universes, wouldn't they be gravitationally attracted to each other? Yes, they would. Um, but so there's two, so there'll be competing forces. There'll be the force due to inflation, which is pushing them apart. And then this gravitational attraction, which is pulling them together. And it's all a matter of which one wins. Um, and in the case of inflation, this inflation force is so powerful that it, oh, it's stronger than, this gravitation force putting things apart is stronger than the gravitational force trying to pull them together. So they still go apart. Is that, uh, is that sort of like the scenario of uh, the multiverse happening in, being due to the Big Bang rather than separate universes having their own Big Bangs? Yes, so that would be in, in that version of the multiverse, uh, yeah. That's, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. All right, Kieran, back to you, mate. Yeah, how am I doing for time, by the way? I think that's well, how, how many slides left, brother? Uh, like three? We've overrun a bit, but... We've overrun a bit, yeah. We're on, we're we're on, on down, so, so we're not yeah. getting kicked out of the Albert to show football right now, so <laughs> please continue. 
Okay, well, yeah, let me, actually, yeah, let me continue on, yes, the last few slides. So, uh, <clears throat> we're talking about inflation, and um, I was going to say, if, if you were getting this talk by pretty much any other scientist, they probably would stop the discussion about inflation and the um, horizon problem there. They'd say, well, inflation explains why the universe is so uniform. Um, and so we kind of answered the question, all we need to do now is work out some of the details and work out whether we have these bubble universes and um, some of the details of the calculation, uh, which, and I should point out this point that there's about 500 different models of inflation with uh, slightly different predictions of what goes on here. Um, but because I'm getting this given talk, I'm going to go a bit deeper uh, and I'm going to ask a question, which is how likely is inflation? Um, and I think this is a very important question because if you remember the horizon problem that we're trying to answer, this, re this question of why the universe looks the same in all directions, is a question of coincidence. There's nothing, I never said there was anything wrong with, uh, the, I never said the Big Bang, you couldn't have a completely uh, uniform universe in the Big Bang theory, just that it was very unlikely that you require this kind of uh, coincidence to happen. So if, um, so, so, if inflation is really going to solve this problem, we better hope that it doesn't require its own coincidence to begin. We better hope that it happens um, generically and doesn't require a coincidence for inflation to begin. Because if inflation requires a coincidence, then we haven't really answered the question. We've just moved it, moved it back a stage. Um, and this is, a, this is a very difficult question to answer. Uh, and there's a lot of debate going on among scientists, as you can see by how, how recently this paper is, as I wrote this only last year. Um, and uh, th there is lots of disagreement on whether this, whether inflation does require a coincidence or doesn't. But since I'm the one giving the talk, I get to give you my take on it um, as to how, uh, yeah, how likely it is. And I get to describe my research on this topic. Um, and my research, the way uh, my research project works was I, with my colleagues, managed to devise a, um, a way of describing inflation using a, a geometrically using a shape, so this shape. Um, if we were in the Albert, I would be able to pass around a 3D version of it. And you can see my, I'd be able to pass this round, but you'll just have to look at it on on my screen. Um, and this, uh, this shape is very closely tied with inflation. Basically, this same mathematics that one uses to describe this shape are also the same mathematics that describe inflation in the early universe. And what we discovered is that every possible way that the universe could have begun can be represented by a different point on this um, shape. And so our take on understanding how likely inflation was is to look at the shape and see well how much of this what part of the shape would I have to start on to get inflation and it turns out that to get inflation you'd have to start right up at the top one of these tips up here or up here which you can see is a very small fraction of the shape and so from this we concluded that actually inflation does require a coincidence to start we do need a coincidence we need we need to start at one of these tips and so our, our conclusion is that actually inflation doesn't work as well as people say it does. And I should point out this point that this is the results of my research. Um, it's been published, it's, uh, it has been peer reviewed and published, but not all scientists agree with me. So I just wanted to add that as a caveat, but from my research and from my um, conclusions, I think that inflation is, is actually not uh, the right solution uh, to this horizon problem because it, um, because it requires its own coincidence to begin, and so it doesn't actually answer the question. So if inflation's not, not right, what is the correct theory? And there's been plenty, several, uh, plenty of other theories of the universe out there, um, but again, because I'm the one giving the talk, I'm gonna talk about one that I've been working on, or I've worked on in the past, uh, and that's something known as the CPT symmetric universe. Now, to understand the idea behind the CPT symmetric universe, we need to understand what I mean by CPT symmetric. Now, CPT stands for three different things that I can do to the universe. So C stands for charge conjugation. 
which is a process which is essentially if I were to replace all matter with antimatter and vice versa. If you remember, uh, antimatter was this kind of evil twin to matter. Every particle has an antiparticle that has the same mass but opposite electric charge. Um, and charge conjugation involves swapping those. P stands for parity, essentially a fancy way of saying reflection. Um, and it essentially uh, involves swapping up and down and left and right, etc. Uh, so you get a reflection. T is time reversal. So that's where you basically hit rewind. So that instead of going forward in time, you're traveling backwards in time. And it turns out that if I perform all three of these transformations, the laws of physics don't care. It's actually a very fundamental rule in physics that the laws of physics look exactly the same if I do this C, P, if I do this C, P, and T transformations. Now, you may think that you may find that a bit strange to understand after particularly this last one, the time reversal, the fact that because, of course, you see plates smashing all the time, but you never see bits of uh, plate coming together to form a big plate. Um, but in fact, it turns out if I were to get all of these pieces of the plate and exactly reversed their um, direction of travel, so doing this parity transformation, these pieces actually would all come together um, and form uh, a plate, just as it's happening in this video. Um, so, uh, but that, the point is that it has, you'd have to do it exactly. If I was slight, ever so slightly off, they'd all miss each other and you wouldn't get the plate formed at all. So CP and T, or CPT together, form a very, a very fundamental to the laws of physics. And the laws of physics are symmetric under the CPT. They don't, they don't care if you do this transformation. But the universe as a whole does care. It's not symmetric under the CPT. It does care if you do it, if you perform it. And you can kind of see that most clearly if we take our timeline of the universe again. Um, in particular, if I look at the T transformation, the time reversal, you'll see that at the moment we have an, a universe that is getting bigger in the future and smaller in the past. If I do a time reversal, I have a universe that's the opposite way around. The universe that's getting smaller in the future and bigger in the past. And no amount of parity or exchanging matter and antimatter is going to change that. So the universe is a whole. So even though the laws of physics um, don't care about this, are in there, uh, symmetric under the CPT, the universe as a whole is not. Now the idea behind the CPT symmetric universe is to try and restore this symmetry. Um, try and restore this symmetry so the universe is symmetric under the CPT. And the way we do that is to focus in on this Big Bang and imagine this Big Bang is not the beginning of uh, space and time, but is actually just a transition between a contracting universe and an expanding one. And if we extend, if, we, if the universe looked like this, then it actually would be uh, symmetric under CPT. And we can see that if we do a C transformation, so we change matter for antimatter, or, red and, or changing red and green. We then do the P, the parity, so flipping the space like that. And finally, we do a T transformation, so flipping uh, backwards and uh, hitting rewind. We see we get back to where we started. Um, and <coughs> the CPT symmetric universe is, um, ha has some really nice properties. Firstly, uh, you can see immediately answers the question, where's the antimatter gone? It's over here. So we have matter on this side, but antimatter over here. So we really immediately answer that question. It also, tell, it also tells us we can look at the Big Bang because uh, it also tells us a bit more about the conditions that must have happened at the Big Bang. Because the laws of physics must be obeyed at all times, when we do this contraction, uh, this contraction changes into an expansion. We must still obey the laws of physics. And so this tells us kind of exactly what conditions we must have at the Big Bang. Um, the third thing it explains, which, which is really nice, is that it actually predicts that there is a huge amount of matter out there that we can't see, which if you remember back is exactly what we observed in the dark matter. So actually, um, so this model, just by adding this uh, extra piece, tells us that we should have dark matter just as we observed. Um, so I think this is quite a nice uh, explanation uh, for the early universe, but of course I would say that because it's, uh, it's my model, so maybe I'm a bit biased. Um, okay, let me, uh, finish there and just summarize my talk.
So space is big, really, really big. We kind of went over how big it was. But even more than that, it's getting bigger. With every minute of every day, space is getting bigger. Turning that on our head, that means that it must have been smaller in the past. And so when we look far enough at, back in the past, the whole universe must have been at a single point, which is, which is the time we know as the Big Bang. Now, we don't really know what happened at the Big Bang, but we have some good ideas. And I, came, I showed you some of the ideas we have. I uh, showed you the theory of inflation, which is probably the most accepted theory um, of the early universe, um, where we had this uh, exponential expansion. Um, I also showed you the CPT symmetric universe, where we had this mirror uh, image universe, this contracting universe before the Big Bang, um, and showed you some of the reasons why at night. And I just want to point out that these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. Uh, it's possible that uh, one or both or neither is, is the correct answer. Um, but since it's my model, I think it's, I think it's this one. Um, okay, thanks very much for listening, and I'll take some more questions. Kieran, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, my mind is currently blown. Can I ask everyone to quickly unmute and give, give Kieran a, a round of applause? Oh, and, and a, get of that man Thank you very much, Kieran. Well, I'm <laughs> <laughs>